Arnie, when we think about human consciousness, the specialness that we all feel about being human, in reality, it gets back to our brain. We have to talk about the brain. How could this three-pound matter, piece of matter, think and feel? It seems incomprehensible. Robert, I guess that's the most pressing question that any of us, <laughs> any of us can answer. And obviously, we, we, don't, we don't know. Let me take a whole brain, just use it as a kind of, more as a thought weight than anything else. We do know that action is based on input and output. Action to be appropriate needs an evaluation, and the sensory input gives us the raw materials for that evaluation. And the output then presumably allows us to produce the activity on the environment which is most useful for the organism at that particular point in time. It's, uh, it, it, it's a bromide to say that the cerebral hemispheres developed to this extent in order to make cognitive activity thoughtful, meaningful decisions possible. So this brain, and we're now looking at the top, now if, how, how would you put this, like if this were in my head, how would that right. look? If this were in your head, your forehead would be here. So I would be down. You'd be this way. Okay. Forehead here, eyes and nose beneath. In back, this would be the back of your head, and of course your neck would be down here. Your spinal cord would be coming up out of the brain stem. So in, in, in its situation, <laughs> this is... This is what you'd have. This could be me. And this, this could be you. As a matter of fact, this is, this brain is in uh, remarkably good shape. Uh, <laughs> uh, very little atrophy. It's uh, just a beautiful specimen of this, this remarkable Except organ. it doesn't have a body. <laughs> it lost it along, along the way, yeah. Uh, and I, you, you asked the basic question, how do we think, how yes. do we feel? Yes, yes, yes. And we don't have the foggiest notion. I can tell you this as a beginning. There are two basic kinds of information that come into the brain. One is the information about how much, what, where, when, the qualia, the components of the individual experience. The other part, the other informational component, is not the quantity and not the quality, but the intensity of the experience. There are actually two parallel systems. One, and I'm going to go to the half brain for this. Okay. One. We're looking at the inside. We're looking at the inside now of the hemisphere. Here's the brain stem that's been cut in half right on midline, right, right in the middle. Information is streaming up, the specific information that we've been talking about, streaming up through the brain stem to what we call fiber bundles or tracts, entering eventually, after many relays, entering the cortex. Then there is a second system that occupies the central core of this so-called brain stem. And this central core carries not specificities about the information, but some very general signatures of the information. How much how frequently is it occurring, mm. and very importantly, what significance does it have to me? We call this central core the reticular formation, which means it has a spattered appearance <laughs> in the histological uh, the preparation. That's unimportant at this point. But these two have to work together, because it's one thing to have specific information. It's another thing to know how urgent it is. Information is flowing in all the time. So we have to establish some priorities. And it is this second system, this reticular or core system, that helps us establish priorities. To give you an example, if there's a stimulus in this room, we're aware of it. If that stimulus goes on regularly, the reticular core re quickly realizes that this is not a threat to us it simply begins to disregard it. And the emphasis that that sensory information gets in the cortex, the emphasis begins to go down, 
And if it continues long enough, we'll disregard it entirely. So the reticulous system, in a sense, monitors uh, our attention and what we focus on. Absolutely. And many people, and I happen to be one of them, feel that one of the basic foundations of what we call the conscious experience, consciousness, lies in this reticular core of the brain stem and its modulation of entire brain, that is to say, of cortical activity. So we have to we have to continuously think of these two systems working together. One, the qualia, the 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 quantum components of the experience, and the other the different sensations. Exactly. The other, the impact, the frequency, and the uh, what shall we importance. say? Importance. The importance. Very good term. The importance of that information, and. The cortex, then, is going to deal with that. And that, of course, is one of the great unsolved problems. How do we deal with that? We, we know that the cortex becomes the repository, not only of the immediate momentary experience, but is and has been the repository of the experiences we've built up over a lifetime, something we call memory. How is memory developed? Well, we know enough now to realize that information-laden memories, names, places, dates, correlations, are probably initially laid down in a deep-set area here on the most inner and undersurface of this part of the brain. We call that the hippocampal dentate complex. We don't yet know how it happens, but we know that it apparently generates a very specific pattern of what we call synaptic or junctional activities. These in turn work on the DNA systems. We produce no new protein. And actual structural changes occur that are somehow transferred widely through the cortex. That's what we call the laying down of memory. The other side of that, of course, is retrieval. We have to be able to retrieve those at the appropriate time. And both of these are profound mysteries. Now, there have been a few patients who have had serious damage to their hippocampus on each side. In some cases, epilepsy or different things. Sometimes they've had to be taken out for epilepsy. What happens when those tiny areas of the brain are damaged? Rather remarkably so. I'm very glad you picked that up. When we have bilateral, that is to say two-sided damage, yes. those patients lose the capacity to lay down new memories. So we can, I can remember what I did as a child or what happened any time exactly. prior to that. Exactly. But it's impossible to have new memories. That's right. So that every time they wake up in the morning, it's a brand new experience. It's like Groundhog Day, the movie. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but Absolutely. it's not funny. You no, know, it's... Uh, and of course, there are some very well-known patients who have suffered this kind of disability and they are among the most studied patients in all of uh, neuroscience. It's a, an example, a, a sad example, but a very informative one of, of when injury can really reveal yes. what natural function is. And this is one of the prime ways in which we have learned about the function of brains, particularly of the human brain, where there are, of course, ethical constraints which limit what we can do experimentally. What about emotion? Emotion is a different, seems to have a different characteristic than yeah. cognitive thinking. Yeah. yeah, we know certain things and there's so much that we don't know. For instance, we know that the experiences that make up emotion seem to be generated in a part of the brain that lies here on the inner surface, we say the medial surface, mm -hmm. and along this great central arc we call this the limbic system. The limbic system includes cortex, and it includes several deep-seated nuclei, one of which is known as the amygdala, which means almond, the little almond. <laughs> the amygdala is located under here, very close, actually, to the hippocampus. And the amygdala is its one of my favorite structures. Uh, if you ask me to define its role in one sentence, I would say the amygdala establishes the emotional valence 
of an experience. What do I mean by that? The amygdala decides if something that happens to you is potentially dangerous or perhaps pleasant. And one of the best examples, it's been quoted many times, is you're walking through a tropical rainforest. With the corner of your eye, you see something coiled under a tree. You recoil and then look at it. It's an old coil of rope. So obviously, something warned us off until we had further cortical activity to evaluate what happens. This quick and dirty response is strictly part of the amygdala's job. Another example, the amygdala in action we now know helps us read the face of what we call a conspecific. You and I are looking at each other, we're reading each other's face, and we're drawing certain conclusions about does he hate me or does he <laughs> feeling friendly toward me? The amygdala is doing that continuously. And we find that in the animal kingdom too, whereas, for instance, in the animal kingdom, there'll be an alpha male or an alpha female, and the others live subserviently to her. You never challenge an alpha male by looking him directly in the eye. Mm. This is confrontational, and the amygdala picks that up immediately, works through a system that's close, the so-called hypothalamus, and sends fight signals. And so the alpha male immediately takes on against you. In human, in the human world, visual confrontation has developed a somewhat different meaning. Mm. meaning. But uh, again, this is the limbic lobe with the amygdala working to generate on a moment-to-moment -moment basis emotional context. The experiencing of the emotion, the pleasure, or the rapidly beating heart and the rapidly increased respiration, they are taken care of by the little structure that the limbic system and the amygdala feed into. We call that the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus directly controls these expressions of emotion that you have. Well, hormones. Through hormones and through direct neuronal connections. And between these, these structures that we've just mentioned, we have an emotionally, I was going to say emotionally valid, an emotionally valid reacting individual. And I say valid because there are syndromes, there are diseases where there's interruption of this system. And then the individual either is unable to express emotion mm -hmm. or cannot control the flares of emotion. We know, for instance, that electrical storms in the amygdala can produce murderous, sociopathic, mm. acting out types of activity. Well, that creates some um, serious challenges to the nature of free will and responsibility and legal liabilities. Very much so. And it's impossible at this point to draw a defective line because uh, at what point does the individual cease having responsibility if his amygdala has a storm? Yeah. So we basically see several kinds of systems. We have the sensory inputs, the specifics. We have the association areas uh, of cognitive uh, associations, cognitive planning for the future and the frontal lobes. And then this fascinating limbic system, which adds emotional context to everything that that comes together and, and makes us human. Makes us what we are. Yes, and as you put it that way, the only thing that I have to add is the fact the component that integrates the feeling tone of an individual mm. with the cognitive highest level personality components are a set of almost anti-intuitive, you might say, unlikely connections between the prefrontal or executive cortex and this system. Here is where we make our decisions to think about the future. Here is the where we feel about these things. We put them together and we have a lot of feeling about becoming something in the, in the world. And in a sense, this, this is our signature. And each one of us is unique, Robert. That's, that's, for me, that's the most remarkable part.